Most of the time, when we fabricate a crown like this, we see a significant amount of interference with the forward movement of the mandible. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jenny, and I'm a part of the education team at Medit. Nice to meet you, everyone. Today, we have Dr. Kim here. Hi, Jenny, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for inviting me over this webinar again. Yeah, thank you for being your doctor. He's a master of all the Medit's app and all the functions of Medit scanners. So today, he came back with second part of the webinar in a huge series of minimizing occlusal adjustment, which is, consists with five parts. I hope everyone had enjoyed the first part of the webinar. So in the previous webinar, it was all about scanning. So I talked about full arch versus to half arch scanning to see the difference of data accuracy and did the experiment to find the best way to scan a bottom to among six ways and checklist before finalized scan, etc. So if you are interested about these topics, you can always reach out to Medit's YouTube channel to watch the previous webinars. And I'm very excited to start over today's webinar as well. Yes, everybody will be so interested about today's topic. So just as the previous webinar, this time the topic is about causes and solution of design error to minimize occlusal adjustment. So before we begin, I have an announcement. <laughs> okay, um, last time I had introduced about Medit's clinic and beta version. It was second version. And this time Medit has released MediLink beta version. So we have prepared an event for that with a MacBook Pro 13 with MediLink beta version. How can I win a MacBook? Let me tell you about it. First, download the Medit link. Second, try it. Third, give us a feedback to beta at medit.com. It's very simple. So try it out and win a MacBook. So I will leave installation link and event page at the description of the YouTube video. Hey, just one thing. Um, if you download the beta version, you'll be able to find a separate app apart from the official version. Once new official version comes up, the beta app won't work anymore, but don't worry. All the data will be safely saved in the cloud. Okay. This time, there are some significant changes. First of all, in the metal link, now you can sort all the data according to the patient's list and filter it and manage it so the work will become much simple. Second, for MediScan for clinics. So first new feature, you can acquire high resolution data by detecting prepared tooth automatically with Medit's AI technology. And smart scan review, this report will just pop up to show about its sufficient scan area, amount of tooth preparation, occlusal contact, et cetera. So we can do some corrections before patients leave. And you will experience improved scanning condition. For example, you can resume scanning quicker than in previous versions after pausing. And improved prevention of misalignment, especially with anterior region, and you can align maxillae and mandible bite easily. And with the AI technology, you can now align the scan data regardless of the tooth numbers. So with the help of these improvements, you'll find it so convenient to use Medit Scanner. Okay, last one. So it's about Medit Scan for Labs. Now the program will automatically perform additional scans after calculating the optimal scan angles. And half arch alignment is available. Okay, that's all about the improvements and new features. Yes, try it out and please feel free to send Medit any feedback. Yeah, please. Okay, before we begin, I would like to remind you all that this video has been pre-recorded and we are gonna have Q&A session right after the lecture is done. 
So we've already collected all of the questions through the email in advance. So we will cover those questions today. And if you would like to watch the previous webinar, or if you would like to watch the clinical videos, please visit our YouTube channel and Medit Academy. Okay, um, shall we begin, doctor? We're going to pick up where we left off last time, talking about how to reduce chair time. Let's talk about what you need to understand when designing a zirconia crown. That's what today's lesson is about. The first thing is to get in the habit of checking for occlusal problems before designing a crown. Second, we'll discuss the value of mandibular movement. Third, we're going to show you how to design the inner surface of a crown while preventing machining errors. Finally, we'll discuss the design of adjacent surfaces. Last time, I mentioned that there could be occlusion errors during scanning. If there's a problem with occlusal alignment, it doesn't matter how good your crown design is. You won't make a good crown. That's why it's necessary to check if there are any occlusion issues before starting the design. These are easy to find occlusal errors. The first is a severe overbite of a certain teeth. The second is when there is an anterior posterior tilting. The third is that a scanned bite differ from the actual occlusal points. First, let's show the case of a severe overbite of a certain tooth. I want to check a case where I didn't anticipate and made an error. I placed the crown and checked the occlusion. A single sheet of 12 micrometers thick occlusal paper comes out easily in front of the crown. Fold it once and it becomes two sheets. This also comes out. Fold it again to make four sheets. This time, it gets stuck but it comes out. Fold it again, for a total of three folds and eight sheets. Finally, it doesn't come out. You can see that it is as high as between four and eight sheets. In terms of thickness, this translates to about 48 to 96 micrometers. Adjusting the occlusal error, it took me about 9 minutes. That's pretty inefficient. Let's run this case through the Medit Occlusal Analyzer to see if we can identify the problem and improve it. We can see that there is an overbite in certain teeth. Select Edit Mode. Cut out the offending tooth and refine the bite scan. Select Alignment Mode and try to realign. Select the Manual Alignment tool and press the Detach All button to move it back to the pre-alignment position. Then define two to three points on the maxilla and mandible and their corresponding points on the occlusion data. Activate compensation and select the third step. The alignment has changed, but it's hard to tell if it's a desirable correction. Let's save and exit to check the relationship of the mandible to the crown we designed earlier. Run. Medit Design. Enter Measurement Mode. Cut a cross section of the designed crown area. The overlap measurements are 45 and 72 micrometers. This is consistent with the clinical results, which were 48 to 96 micrometers higher. Based on this case, we can conclude that before designing, if a severe overbite is identified that is different from the surrounding teeth, it is recommended that the area be software cut and the bite realigned. The second is when there is an anterior or posterior tilt. 
It's easy to look for things that are tilted in the anterior-posterior direction. I was able to identify this issue before design and use the Medit Occlusal Analyzer to solve it. It won't be perfect, of course, but you'll be able to make a crown that fits easily with minor adjustments. In this patient's case, two crowns were fabricated, one for the initial bite and one for the modified bite. I was informed that the second crown was used to finalize the treatment. The last is when the scanned occlusion differs from the actual occlusion. If you take a bite with an occlusal paper and scan it, the scan data will show the occlusal points. If the intersection of the scan file differ from the actual occlusal points, it's time to refine with the occlusion analyzer. Cut out the overbite and realign it with the next bite scan file. You should see an improved result. This is the conclusion of the first topic. You should check for occlusal issues before designing. If problems are found, it's helpful to modify them using software. Second, let's look at the value of the mandibular movement record. The occlusal plane of the antagonist, reflecting mandibular movement, would look like this. Place the scanner tip where the upper and lower jaw meet while the patient maintains contact between the jaws. When the scanner starts recording, a live view window appears on the screen. Then instruct the patient to move the mandible according to the direction of movement you selected. Make sure that both the lower and upper teeth appear in the live view. We are using the articulator with the expectation that it will reduce the amount of occlusal adjustment. Let's see if it actually helps. The crown is machined in the usual way and mounted on the virtual articulator. The result is an occlusal adjustment to match the movement of the articulator. Most of the time, when we fabricate a crown like this, we see a significant amount of interference with the forward movement of the mandible, especially for anterior teeth. So, let's go ahead and bring in a bite that reflects the mandibular movement and adjust the occlusion. We're going to see a significant amount of adjustment. If we were to measure it, we'd get a value over 600 micrometers. With this amount of intraoral occlusal adjustment, the length of the crown that you see may be shortened. You may have to take it out a little bit buckly to get the crown length. As a result, if the crown is made with only articulator adjustments, it may need to be ground down a lot or remade. Conclusion number two. Using mandibular movement recordings to create a crown is more meaningful than using an articulator. Our next topic is the inner design of a crown. You may know that cement gaps use die spacers to give cement thickness. Here, we'll explain cement gaps that consider the characteristics of the milling method. I've been experimenting with cement gaps. First, let's see what happens if we give a uniform cement gap when designing the inner surface. I tried giving a constant cement gap of 50 micrometers. On the left is the design file. I chose the coping type to avoid pinching errors with adjacent surfaces. On the right is a photo of the machined result adapted to the model. The right side was scanned and compared to the design file on the left. The fact that this is from an old lecture and did not use Medit software does not matter. Ways to verify the machining results with Medit software will be explained in the next lecture. On the left is the 50 micrometers resolution. The dark red color represents the error region beyond 50 micrometers. These are concentrated in the line angle area. 
This crown will eventually have premature contact at the line angle and will not go in all the way. The photo on the right shows the result of a crown that retracts 70 micrometers less. The sharper the angle of the line angle, the higher the machining error. Therefore, it's necessary to round the line angles. This is my favorite dedicated burr for rounding line angles. Round off the line angle. It helps to use a dedicated burr. Think of a 0.5 mm curvature corresponding to a radius of 1 mm for a zirconia tool diameter. Keep in mind that overrounding can be detrimental to retention. Rounding line angles does not eliminate all machining errors. First, let's look at the machining errors that can be calculated. When a plane is machined equidistant with a rounded tool, it leaves a wavy area like the image. The height portion of this error is called the scallop height. The scallop height that would have resulted from machining at 0.1 mm constant spacing using a 1 mm round burr is calculated to be 2 micrometers. I'll skip the detailed calculations because I don't think you'll want to know. What's important is that 2 micrometers is a significant difference from the 60 micrometers error seen at the line angle identified earlier. This can be explained by the different areas that are machined and left behind in flat and curved machining. Figure 2 is an enlargement of the rectangular part in Figure 1. Figure 3 is the residual area after machining a relatively straight part. Figure 4 shows the machining residue of a deeply curved area, colored in red. The second was to give the line angles an additional cement gap corresponding to the machining error. The machining error of the line angle can be reduced, but not eliminated. So, I tried machining with a cement gap of 60 micrometers for the line angle and 30 micrometers for the rest, which is less than the 50 micrometers I gave in the previous experiment. This value reflects the machining error identified in the machining error validation and can vary from machine to machine. You should watch this with the understanding that your machine may differ from mine. I purchased my equipment after going through this verification myself. I'd like to say that machining precision is prioritized over machining speed and the price of the equipment. I'd also like to add that you shouldn't only look at the data from the equipment company, but check it yourself before buying it. We'll talk more about this next time. These photos validate the machining results. The photo on the left shows the scan data of a crown that was machined with an additional cement gap in the line angles, compared with a redesigned file with a uniform 30 micrometers cement gap. The result shows that a uniform cement gap was achieved. The photo on the right shows the machined crown positioned on the model, and a comparison between the scanned file and the design file shows a vertical error of about 10 micrometers. It went in all the way. It may be difficult to understand, so let me explain again. When machining the inner surface, additional machining errors will occur at the line angles. When designing the inner surface, give the line angles an additional cement gap equal to this number. The different machining errors result in a uniform inner offset. Let's demonstrate the retention power of the crowns created in experiments 1 and 2. Position the first crown and press it down well. Flip the model over and it falls right off. 
This is a result of early contact in the line angle and a relatively large space in the inner surface. Place the second crown, apply good pressure, and flip the model over. It has a uniform internal fit, resulting in a good retention. Here is a paper that shows why a uniform and thin cement gap is important. This paper shows that resin cement thickness affects zirconia's shear bond strength. It is a result of uniform actual cement thickness between planes, not crowns. Resin cements were applied at 50, 80, 160, and 240 micrometers intervals to check the shear bond strength. We can conclude that the thinner the thickness, the higher the bond strength. If so, we can conclude that if we get a uniform and thin inner fit, we can bond thinner zirconia stronger and make it less brittle. As a result, we'll be able to do less occlusal surface removal. Let me give you a case example of another advantage of a uniform cement gap. This is a patient who came to me for root canal treatment with a zirconia crown in tooth number 27 from another dental clinic. The dentist who did the crown was a well-known prosthodontist, and the patient was also a dentist. I replaced the crown, and it's been about three years now, and she hasn't had a root canal since. What did I pay attention to when making the crown? As the astute among you may already know, I addressed the hypersensitive symptoms by simply placing uniform, thin cement spacings on the inside of the crown. This phenomenon is explained by the increased stress on the tooth due to polymerization shrinkage as the resin adhesive thickness increases. We can conclude by saying that the cement gap should reflect the machining errors when designing the inner surface of a crown. This will result in a uniform and thin cement gap. The key to contact design is to avoid multiple floss catches on adjacent surfaces. When creating a large surface area for less food to snag on, it's easy for the crown to become concave horizontally or vertically. This causes the floss to get caught multiple times as you move it up and down or in and out. This makes it difficult for food to get in and out easily. As a result, food can get stuck between the teeth, causing permanent gaps or inflammation of the gums. This is the crown case for implant number 26. Note the shape of the contact point with number 25. If you look at the actual design, you'll see that the missile adjacent faces are overfilled lingually. This is a video of a patient who came in a year later with food stuck in her teeth. As a result, his missile contact space has become open. When preparing a tooth, you need to make sure that the adjacent surfaces of the neighboring teeth are even. If this is not the case when designing the crown, it should be reflected in the design and compensated by trimming the neighboring teeth at the time of setting. In the picture, you can see that the adjacent surface of tooth number 17 is uneven. The technicians are supposed to notify me when this happens. Here I am correcting the design myself. I'll remember this and use it as a reference to trim the teeth during crown delivery. In the end, it turned out well. Adjacent sides of the crown should not be concave. Let's summarize today's lesson. The process of designing a zirconia crown starts with the previous step of preparing the tooth and checking for any errors made during scanning. If there is a problem with the occlusal alignment, it can be corrected to some extent, although not completely by software. 
Mandibular movement records will produce more meaningful results than articulators. Giving the line angle an additional cement gap will result in a uniform and thin cement gap. The contact point design should not be concave, and if the adjacent teeth are not flat, the dental technician is advised to communicate with the dentist to create the crown. Thank you for sharing all your tips with us, Dr. Kim. Yes, I tried my best to include all the clinic tips to this lecture. So please let me know if you have any questions about lecture. So let's move on to the Q&A session. Yes, today we have four questions in total. So let's start with the first question. Question number one. I haven't tried Medix Clinic Cat yet. So is it reliable just like the other paid CAD apps? Can you tell us some advantages of Clinic CAD app? Medic Clinic CAD is a software focused on 3D printing. I have no problem printing temporary teeth, but I use ExoCAD when building zirconia crowns to give them an additional cement gap. I'm waiting for Clinic CAD to be updated. It will be updated soon. <laughs> Question number two. What do you think is the most important factor to consider in a design stage? Internal fit is the first priority. This requires the use of an additional cement gap. Mm -hmm. Second is the occlusion. You need to get in the habit of making sure your occlusion scan is correct before you start designing. And last thing is the design of the adjacent surfaces. It is also important to ensure that food does not get stuck. Mm. Babe, thank you for sharing your tips. Mm, question number three. How do you utilize Maddox Clinic Cat in your clinic? Do you sometimes design simple processes by yourself? As I had mentioned earlier, I don't use Medic Clinic Cat to design zirconia crown yet. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do the design myself, but my dental technician is better than me. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, last question. Is there any clinical tip to have a perfect marginal fit when I want to do with modeless weight? Uh, internal fit is the uh, first priority. When designing, you need to reflect machining error to achieve an, a thin and even cement gap. Secondly, you need to calibrate and maintain your equipment regularly. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all about it for today. You'll be able to watch this webinar on our YouTube channel and Medit Academy once it's completed. Thank you for being here, Dr. Kim. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Hope to see you at our next webinar. Bye. Bye.